Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bharatiya, and welcome to a special edition of TFR. Let's talk with Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rack. And today we are going to talk about 30 years of Linux. Rob, um, if we look at, or if, if I ask you to reflect on these 30 years of Linux, the way I see it as it has paved path for a lot of open source technologies uh, where commercial players got comfortable with open source, otherwise they were kind of distancing themselves from open source. But they are also fact that a lot of companies like Microsoft, they were doing a lot of open source, but they hated Linux back then. Uh, but their open source was more or less like you can see the code, but you cannot do anything else with the code. So talk about how do you see these 30 years? Linux has not just transformed operating systems, but it really has transformed the way the industry works together. Uh, it's created whole new opportunities. It's, it's really found ways that we can find software that is a common building block in everything that we build. It's, it's really impossible to escape Linux and the Linux kernel specifically in any you know, application system, machine, computer, phone that we've built. Um, and that, that footprint is, is remarkable. Um, you know, it's taken a long time to get here. 30 years is, is, a, is a good run. Um, and there's no doubt, you know, with the trajectory that we're on, it's going to continue to have tremendous impact uh, on the industry. I mean, it's kind of hard to say or visualize how the world would look like without beta tape or whatever it is. But if we do look at Linux in today's world, all the way from Facebook servers, uh, to our ring bell, to our Android power phone, or WebOS power TVs, no, even it is on Mars, the world would have been a totally different place. So if I ask you that, what are the industries that you see, uh, in a way kind of would not even exist if there was no Linux kernel? Yeah, I mean, if the simplest one is cloud as as a whole would not exist without the Linux kernel. I mean, you have to rewind 30 years. We had Linux or we had Unix systems, but they were very closely affiliated with the vendors and tied to the hardware. And so each you know company that was making a Unix flavor had hardware, and those things were very tied together, very similar to the way Apple is today. And the introduction of Linux slowly broke that apart. It really allowed the x86 uh, platforms that were really popular as PCs to become general purpose systems. And they, they changed the cost dynamics dramatically, right? When the LAMP stack was introduced, all of a sudden people had a way to buy commodity systems and do work that had been trapped by Solaris and, and Oracle. Um, and that you know, completely changed the economics of running the infrastructure that we take for granted today in cloud. And, and the major vendors built on top of that, right? The idea that they can take, you know, commodity infrastructure, open source software as the underlying pieces and, and build, you know, huge uh, footprints of, of managed infrastructure is transformative. Um, and you're right, it shows up in everywhere from stock markets and, and you know, space vehicles to our phones and, and IoT devices. That's a huge range. And if you just you know, quickly you know, uh, zoom in and look at Rack and how are you folks leveraging Linux in uh, the kernel? Linux has been really essential to what we build. We, we do uh, infrastructure automation and provisioning. And the fact that we can interact with systems at the kernel level and in a consistent way is essential to us building successful uh, scaled out provisioning. Even though we're provisioning other operating systems too, you know the Windows and VMwares, uh, you know the idea that we have the type of control and consistency that we get with Linux is the essence of building stable, repeatable processes, um, and and that's been you know absolutely essential to being able to to build repeatable process. I mean that's we see this over and over again across the industry. You know Linux isn't the fastest moving most, you know, it's not taking advantage of every feature. It's not always the best, it's, but it's good enough in every category. And that means that we can build on top of it and rely on our ability to get in, fix, inspect, change. Um, it's really been essential. As the saying goes, it's better to be a jack of all trades than a master of one. Uh, that's what Linux is in a way or other. Uh, Linux kind of, as you gave some example, dominates the, I think uh, I was talking to Dirk and I say, you know, that initially Linux's, you know, email will have, you know, a signature line. 
Linux got Torvald's fast word domination. Linux kind of dominates the world today, but what are the areas that you still see, hey, these are the areas that are still untouched and that's where Linux should be uh, going? Yeah, Linux, you know, we're, we're sitting on a wave of new hardware innovation. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that we're seeing new types of chips, new architectures, new approaches to building infrastructure and actually much more integrated in infrastructure into our daily lives. And so for that to work, we have to have consistent control processes for them. And that starts at the kernel and then works its way up. Um, it's, it's challenging, right? We, we need to see a lot more hardware change, hardware innovation, new technologies and approaches coming in. Um, and that's gonna put a lot of stress on how the kernel gets built and managed, uh, right? As with such a big community, and this is where Linus and his you know, stewardship, I, I wouldn't call it world domination. I really is, this is stewardship because everybody's using this platform to innovate, to add, to extend, to solve their needs. And they can do it without his permission, but you know, ultimately they want what they've done to be added back into the system. And as that process continues, then that means that we all benefit across the board on how these things go. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, sort of purposefully deliberate. Um, you know, things don't sort of flip and, and jump around really fast, but that's what makes Linux, Linux such a powerful platform. It's predictable. Right, we have very good community governance. We can see what's happening. We have ways that people can add to it. Um, and even beyond how Linux is formed, that sort of tempo and open source community governance has you know, been a critical component on, on how things go. It's we, uh, you know, and this is one of the things that, that Linux has been saying about what happened in his career, right? The introduction of Git, which was done to make Linux a more community sustainable operating system in itself revolutionized how we operate together as communities. And, and is a, you know, almost as important an innovation in, in collaborative community development, even corporate development. Since you brought this topic, so I do want to ask a few things. Uh, there are a lot of ways where unique is unique. Number one is that the way they are writing Linux code, it's still being done on mailing lists, even though Linux created Git to solve uh, the versioning uh, problem there. Uh, in post-pandemic world, during the pandemic, we talked about the remote work, you know, distributed workforce. That's what Linux kernel has always been. You know, the, the kernel community is all across the globe. The, the, the contributions are coming from everywhere. We talk about diversity. This is also one of the most diverse communities out there. We also talk about, you know, meritocracy in the Linux kernel. All you have to do is open the mail, send a patch. If it is good, it will be accepted. It's not good, it will not be accepted. You will get some feedback. So it all already set a lot of you know paths for a lot of communities that we talk about. Hey, remote culture, remote work. Blah. What do you think about the culture impact? We don't talk about it as much. Yeah, I think that you know it's easy to accept open source as status quo today. Uh, it's important to realize that it wasn't at all. It, it was an experiment, uh, you know, tw even 20 years ago as Red Hat was starting to come on the scene and, and make these things work and corporations paid a lot of money to Red Hat because they were afraid of being sued for using open source code. Um, so it, it is without a doubt very much a, a piece of how we have transformed, you know, working together and building things together. Um, and it's given companies who want to use Linux and, and other open source projects a lot of um, authority to feel like they understand how the processes work and that they can collaborate on it. Um, it's interesting as much as you what you're saying is true about how easy it is to get into the kernel, there's two things that are really important um, about this. One is it's not that easy to get into the kernel um, and it's supported by the fact that there are so many people testing and verifying what the systems are behind the scenes and that a kernel change doesn't break all of the different use cases, right? That, that level of testing and integration is an important piece. Um, but one of the things about the Linux kernel is, you know, most people don't contribute. It's, it's widely contributed, it has a very diverse base, but most people treat it as an operating system, right? It's, it's locked, they don't mess with it any more than they would expect to reverse engineer Windows uh, and contribute back to Windows from that perspective. Uh, and some people in open source communities see that as a negative thing. I, I actually see that type of wide de facto use 
uh, part of the success factor of, of making it happen, right? We, we don't want to, we don't have a burden with Linux of spending a lot of time trying to hack the kernel or make device drivers work anymore or things like that. We've, we've been through all that over the last 30 years. Um, and one of the things I hope as we look forward into the next 30 years is that ease of use and accessibility of Linux becomes much, much higher. That, you know, we can actually, you know, Linux on the desktop, which is, you know, perennial joke for a lot of us, uh, is something where people could actually start seeing Linux show up on, on their devices um, and, and not worry about, you know, having to understand how to manage and maintain and things like that. It's, it's progressed dramatically in the last 10 years. And as you know, I think we will continue to see ease of use and, and more adoption in more user-facing applications. Now, since we are looking at 30 years of Linux and we talked about how it contributed to human society, actually, I look at a very big uh, picture, but there may also be some gray areas where you think, hey, things could have been better with the kernel. What would that be? You know, one of the, the trade-offs that we make in Linux um, is that it is good enough. And so, and it's a community system. So it, it's very difficult for one company to run ahead, to have a, a new hardware type or a new idea, a IPv6 or an improved security me mechanism and get that into the system, right? Uh, Solaris had zones way before we had containers and, and segmentation. And so one of the things that we've had as a trade-off is to have a common stable platform that people could innovate on. We have also been moving in a much more measured pace than we would if we had, you know, force people to pick individual vendors and lock into that that technology stack. Um, we also aren't beholden to individual vendors, and so I think that that you know the trade-off, which I think we should make deliberately, has been a you know one of the ones that we we can scratch our heads and say you know there are things that we have not moved as fast on. Um, you know, Apple and and innovating the hardware and the software together, you know, has done a lot to move things forward. Um, but at the same time, I, you, you can scratch your head and ask, is the walled garden worth uh, what we've built for it? And I think Linux has really forced us to ask, you know, what happens when we don't have the corporate governance, um, you know, the profit motives driving every decision. Um, and that's been a really positive thing, I think, not just for the IT industry, but society as a whole. Before we wrap this up, I do want to, of course, one thing that the pandemic has taught us is don't talk about in things in future tense, you know, that, hey, what things will look like in five years, six years, two. Just tell me what do you think about tomorrow. That's the best thing we can ask. But if I ask you, looking at the trajectory, especially as you mentioned, the cloud and all those things, uh, where do you think things are heading? Do you have any predictions uh, for Linux? I do. I, I think Linux is going to end up allowing us to continue to push innovation and ownership of technology deeper into users' hands. Um, right now, we're in a wave with cloud where things have really been moving back into big centralized corporate control. Um, and Linux has created a benefit in doing that. But fundamentally, the goal here is that people can own their own technology, manage their own technology. And the trajectory that Linux is on will continue to drive that forward. And I'm very optimistic that we're going to be building on top of Linux in ways that return power and control and destiny of, of people's daily infrastructure, right, their daily lives, back to the individuals who are, who are doing that. And that's only possible because of the type of community, the type of reach, and the, the type of culture that Linux has built. So I'm very optimistic about the future of technology in general. And Linux is a core part of making that possible. Rob, thank you so much for uh, looking back 30 years, uh, how Linux changed the world around us and how it will continue to change it. Thanks for sharing those insights. And of course, I'll have you uh, back on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. Talk to you soon.